Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. It uh, looks like we have most of the people that registered. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm uh, Glenn Coldren. I uh, am lead on our uh, oyster restoration program here at FOS. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, that program today. So I'm going to go over a little bit of background of what oysters are, um, a little bit of what some of the threats are to those oysters. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how our uh, restoration program aims to try and um, bring back some oysters to our local waters uh, and help bring some of the services that oysters bring um, with them to that waters. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll go over all that as we go through. Um, but I wanna, uh, do wanna point out that um, since we're, we're doing this digitally, um, probably the easiest way to ask questions if you have them is to uh, type them up um, and send them over on chat or in the QA box. Um, and then once I'm done with the presentation, I'll try and answer as many of those questions as I can uh, when we get to that point. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So let's start off talking about a little bit of what oysters are. Uh, and that'll give you a little background um, and sort of inform some of the threats and some of the, the ways that we go about in restoring oysters. Uh, so oysters uh, are in the phylum mollusca. Um, they're classified in that same phylum that includes things like snails, squids, um, clams, mussels, all of those fall into mollusca. Um, it's a very diverse group. Uh, that group actually Although people typically think of them as sort of oceanic marine species, they occur uh, very commonly throughout brackish areas like estuaries. Um, they also occur in freshwater bodies, uh, lakes and streams, and they even occur in la on land. Um, the snails that you see in your yard, um, those are actually in the phylum mollusca. Uh, and then within, within that, uh, oysters are part of a uh, class by Valvia. Um, by meaning two and valve basically meaning shell. Uh, so they're, they're two shelled animals, two shelled invertebrate animals, so no vertebrae. Um, and bivalves are gonna include obviously oysters, but also things like clams and mussels. Uh, and these are a pretty important group. Um, humans have been eating bivalves for a long time, so they've been an important nutritional staple for humans for, for centuries. Uh, and actually that sort of leads into one of the classifications or naming schemes of oysters. Um, so when you start looking at oysters specifically, uh, they can be separated out in a number of different groups. One of the more common ways of grouping them is into this term sort of true oyster uh, and then others. And basically true oysters are gonna include all the edible oysters, pretty much. Uh, and those are gonna be, you know, if you've eaten an oyster, you've eaten a true oyster. Uh, then there's a few others. There's pearl oysters uh, and things like that um, that aren't typically things people are gonna eat. Okay, so how many species of oysters are there? Uh, that actually turns out to be a bit of a tricky question. Uh, depending on the classification scheme you use um, and who you ask, you can get numbers anywhere from about 30 to 100 species. And a lot of that has to do with the way species identification is done traditionally. Um, so traditionally, when you want to determine whether you know, two oysters are the same species or not, you're going to do it morphologically. You're basically going to look at how the oyster looks. Uh, and that can be tough. I mean, if you think about an oyster, there's basically two different parts of them that you can look at to see if they are different from a different species of oyster. There's the soft body on the inside and then there's the shell itself. On uh, a soft body on the inside, it's pretty similar across many of the species. Um, obviously there are some differences, but in a lot of cases it's not particularly helpful to tell a species apart. So a lot of the classification is done by the shell shape and color, size, how many ridges and things it has on it. Uh, and that sort of leads to some of the difficulties. Uh, oysters change how they grow their shell uh, very often based on the conditions they're growing in. So an uh, oyster 
that's growing, you know, in a very sparse environment where there's not a lot of other oyster individuals around um, is going to grow differently than, say, an oyster that's really clustered together with a lot of oysters right next to it. You know, if they're really dense, they're really packed together, a lot of oyster species are going to grow much thinner, much taller. Um, you know, if there's predators around, some species will make their shells thicker with more ridges. Um, and, you know, that can all mean that you have a lot of diversity of the shell shape within a species as well as between species. And so that can make it really difficult to tell morphologically what are different species. Uh, and so there's work uh, that's been going on for a while now to start using genetic tests to start teasing apart those morphologically similar species. Uh, and I'd actually encourage you, there's a really interesting website, uh, marinespecies.org, that actually has a really uh, nice interactive a classification scheme that you can look at um, and look at how oysters and a lot of other marine groups are actually classified and broken down and some of the explanations for why they're classified that way. I'd, I'd recommend going to that website. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the life history of oysters. So oysters uh, are going to be pretty much oceanic and brackish, um, so they're going to be in sort of um, salty conditions to some extent. Now, um, one of the really important parts of the oyster life history that actually plays a really big role in our restoration program is that many species of oysters are broadcast spawners. Uh, and basically how this works is um, the adults are gonna produce sperm and egg, and they're gonna basically release that sperm and egg into the water column and then the water is going to disperse those sperm and egg around. Eventually they meet up, they fertilize, they um, then develop into juvenile uh, larvae oysters. And those uh, larvae are actually going to be planktonic. So they're going to be primarily carried by the currents in the water. Um, you know, they have a little bit of ability to sort of go up and down in the water column side to side. They're pretty much going to get carried where the current takes them. Uh, and that's, uh, depending on the species, several weeks that those larvae are going to float in the water. At the end of that time, once they've developed enough, they're going to start basically searching for a place to settle down and basically make their home and live there permanently the rest of their life. Um, so. After a couple weeks, they're going to start bouncing along the bottom and they're going to be looking for a hard substrate, a hard structure, like another oyster shell, um, seawall, a rock, something like that, where they're going to attach to and then start growing. Um, when they attach, they're then called spat, uh, which is a term that will pop up a few times throughout this talk. So um, yeah, I want to point that term out. Uh, and what's really important about that is basically an oyster, if, you know, after that several weeks, if they don't find a place to settle down, uh, if there's no hard substrates, uh, they'll end up actually dying. Uh, they don't have a place to settle on. And they actually can be pretty picky about where they settle on. Uh, and if you think about it, um, you know, because they're sessile as adults, because once they settle, they're there for the rest of their life and they can't move, they need to pick a good spot. Uh, and so they're picky and they can choose where they want to settle down a little bit based on some things like um, if there's a lot of calcium on the structure that they're, they're testing, that's a good sign. Um, if there's other chemicals from other living oysters in the water, that's a good sign. If other oysters can live there, it can probably live there too. Uh, and that's something we also take advantage of in our restoration program. You know, we use oyster shells because it encourages the spat to settle down on them. Okay. Uh, one other thing I want to point out that's a little bit interesting um, about oysters and is, is fairly relevant is that spawning event where they release this, the sperm and egg into the water column in a lot of species is regulated by temperature. So once temperatures sort of rise in the water above a certain point, that's going to instigate the males and females to start producing sperm and egg and then releasing them into the water column. Uh, and that's really important for timing. Um, you know, if all the males are 
releasing their sperm at one time and all the females release their sperm a couple months later, well, that's not gonna work out because they're not gonna be in the water column at the same time and that reproduction won't be successful. So that temperature regulation of spawning is actually a pretty important um, factor. And it's something that'll come up in one of the threads that we'll talk about to oysters in a little bit. Uh, another thing that's a little interesting in oysters is uh, many of the species actually can change sex as they age. Uh, so the oysters that we have here locally tend to be male when they're young and small uh, and actually transition into female as they get bigger and older. Uh, and there's some different theories of why that is, but uh, one of the leading ones is that uh, it's a lot easier and cheaper to make um, the male sperm, so you get basically better bang for your buck. If you're a smaller individual, you can make more um, offspring now. Okay. So I want to take just a quick aside here, just for one slide for a minute, uh, and talk about a term that probably pops up pretty often if you start looking into uh, oyster restoration, or particularly if you're looking into oyster aquaculture. Um, also, I apologize, there's a lawn mowing going on just outside, so if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, so, oyster aquaculture, you'll hear this term triploid oyster um, show up pretty often. Uh, and it's an interesting uh, type of oyster that is actually selectively bred, it's not genetically modified, um, that grows faster than a normal oyster, tends to be more resistant to diseases than normal oysters. Uh, and basically the reason for that is they're non-reproductive, or at least they tend to be non-reproductive. Uh, and basically their reproductive systems are underdeveloped. They don't put much energy into producing sperm or egg. Um, they don't put much energy into, you know, producing the organs that produce those. And so they put virtually all their energy into growth, into survival, into fighting diseases. Um, and so that means they're going to grow faster, they're going to get bigger, um, they're going to be uh, more resistant to diseases because of that. Uh, and so I just want to point that out. That's a term you see a lot. Uh, it can be a little bit of a confusing term uh, that we see sometimes when we're trying to do some research on oysters. So all right, let's get back to it. So a little bit more of the life history of oysters. So oysters are filter feeders. This is actually a really important part of some of the benefits that oysters provide. Uh, so what is a filter feeder? Uh, it's basically a type of animal that is going to pump water through some sort of filter. In this case, the oysters are pumping water through their gills. Uh, and those gills have mucus on it. They're gonna trap small suspended particles in the water. And those particles could be pieces of algae, um, it could be uh, zooplankton, little tiny uh, microscopic animals. Uh, it could be sand. Um, in some cases, it could actually be microplastics. Um, and basically, that's how they're going to get their food. And in the process, that's also how they're going to get their oxygen. So once those particles get trapped in the mucus, they're going to then move those particles into their digestive system. They're going to eat that and that's how they get their nourishment. Uh, sort of similar to like a baleen whale, um, you know, as they filter the krill out of the water. And oysters are sort of doing a similar function. Um, now, oysters, a typical healthy oyster on average is going to filter about 25 gallons of water a day, which is quite a lot when you think an oyster is only a couple inches long. Um, but in an ideal condition with a large adult oyster, um, that number can actually be 50 gallons a day. And so if you add that up, if you think about how many oysters are in an oyster reef, and how many reefs there can be in an estuary, and you're talking hundreds of thousands of oysters uh, in a relatively small area, that can add up to a lot of water being filtered every single day. Um, so uh, an estimate of that in Chesapeake Bay, um, you know, 100 years ago, back before the declines from overfishing and all sorts of other things happened, uh, it's estimated that oysters could actually filter the entire body of water in just three days. Uh, and that would, as you imagine, have a 
really massive impact on the water quality of that estuary. Um, it's going to keep the water clearer, it's going to keep down nutrients and all sorts of other things. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we really want to restore oysters. We want to bring some of that function back. All right, another term that you'll see pop up a couple times, and it's relevant um, when we talk about things like dealing with high levels of suspended um, solids like sand and things like that, is feces versus pseudo feces. So when an oyster filter feeds, when it brings those particles onto its gills, it has to be somewhat selective about what it actually moves into its digestive system and what it sort of kicks out. Uh, everything it digests takes energy, and if it's not getting a return on that investment, it's not a good idea for it to digest that. Um, and so the, the, the food items, the algae, for example, it's gonna pick those up and it's gonna put it through its digestive system. It's gonna digest that, it's gonna get resources and it makes species. The things that it kicks out, um, you know, sand particles, um, some of the algaes that are toxic, uh, it can be sort of selective. It can kick those out and those produce what's called pseudo feces. Okay. All right. So I want to show you a very brief video um, that is going to sort of give you a demonstration of what uh, oysters can do as far as filter feeding. And so this, this particular video is going to show you uh, two tanks. The tank on the left is a tank full of um, water with a lot of algae in it. The tank on the right ha also has a lot of algae in the water, but it also has live oysters. And so what you're going to see is uh, filtering from those oysters occurring over less than two hours. So let me show you this and you can see just how dramatic an impact that filtering can have on the water clarity in just a short amount of time. So you can see there that over just less than two hours, you've gone from water that you can barely see through to water that's actually quite clear. And that's the impact of the filter feeding of all of those oysters in that water. Okay, so now that we know oysters are important, we know a little bit of background about what oysters are. Uh, let's briefly touch on some of the history of oysters in the United States. Now, obviously, there's a lot more that I'm going to talk about here. I just want to touch on some of the really big points. Um, so oysters have been used by the Native Americans uh, in North America for hundreds of years. Um, they were used, obviously, for food. Um, but the shells were actually used uh, for currency in some cases. Uh, tools were made out of them. In, e in some cases, they even made jewelry uh, out of those shells. Uh, and we know a lot of this actually from these, these structures called shell middens, uh, which are basically uh, Native American landfills um, where they, all the discarded shells uh, were, were put. Um, these, these piles can actually get quite large. Uh, they can be 10 or 20 feet high in some cases, uh, and it actually has a really interesting historical record uh, in them. Um, there's actually shell middens locally along any river drive. Uh, there's a number of shell middens uh, that you can find, particularly on the western side of the lagoon. Uh, and that was a pretty, you know, seemed to be somewhat sustainable uh, fishery of oysters. And then you have, in the early 1800s, you had commercial harvesting of oysters begin. Now, obviously, this, you know, that's going to depend a lot on the specific area you're talking about, uh, when that actually started. But basically, you had commercial harvesting start in oysters, and within, you know, 100, 150 years, um, a lot of the fisheries, a lot of the populations of oysters started to be heavily depleted from overfishing as a result. Uh, and that happened in many, many oyster fisheries. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the impacts of that in a minute. Okay, so when we're talking about oysters being depleted, um, why do we care? Well, it turns out oysters are pretty important and they're important in a lot of different ways. Um, obviously, we know oysters are a very valuable 
um, fishery. Um, you know, they're eaten by humans a lot, and that's a really important commercially. Um, but oysters also provide a lot of other services. Uh, one of the uh, really important ones is that they're a sentinel species. They're basically a canary in a coal mine for the water bodies that they're in. Um, if you think about it, an oyster is sessile as an adult, so it's not going to be able to go anywhere. Um, so it's it's stuck. If the water body it's in starts to decline, starts to have bad salinity, bad oxygen, starts to be getting hit by um, bad water quality, that oyster can't move. Okay, So that means you can go there year after year, you can look at the same reef, and you can see how those oysters are doing in that reef. It gives you a good idea of sort of the overall water quality in that area. Um, they're also uh, provide a lot of services through filtering that water. They're going to make the water clearer. That's going to help support things like seagrasses, which are nurseries for other commercially important species. Um, they're also going to, while they filter feed, they're going to take nutrients out of the water. So they're going to help do things like remove nitrogen um, from that water, which can have its own damaging effects. Um, the oyster reefs themselves provide uh, food and habitat for a number of other important species like blue crabs, um, which are their own important and commercially valuable fishery. They also create oyster reefs, at least some of the species do. And oyster reefs are basically an aggregation of living oysters attaching to and building on top of dead oyster shells. Uh, they're sort of structurally similar to a coral reef, you know, where you have layers of dead oyster shell that have, you know, been built uh, year after year, generation after generation, you have sort of a top skin of living oysters. Uh, and those reefs themselves provide a lot of benefits that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but reefs come in a number of different um, shapes and sizes and structures, um, depending on sort of the environment they're in. Uh, you can get um, clusters of oysters that are just a few oysters clustered together. Um, you can get oyster clusters on mangrove prop roots, or you can get all the way up into oyster beds and banks that are hundreds of feet long um, and can actually um, be quite impactful to the community around them. Um, oyster reefs also can occur subtidally, so in areas where they're always underwater, no matter how high or low the tide is, or intertidally, uh, where they are exposed to the air at some point of the day as the tide goes down. Okay, uh, and a lot of that depends on the temperature and salinity of the water, um, and those can have really different impacts. So intertidal reefs are going to be really impactful uh, in uh, altering wave patterns, uh, in addition to doing all the filtering and things that oysters do. Uh, oh, I wanted to point out here that this reef, this is a reef that you might see in the middle or upper in the river lagoon. Um, so this is an intertidal reef. Uh, you can see that this is quite long uh, and it actually has mangroves uh, embedded into this reef that have sort of colonized and uh, given these mangroves an opportunity to grow. Uh, and this here is actually a restored oyster reef uh, in downtown Store. This is at Flagler Park. Uh, this is a reef that we were involved in restoring. And so you can see all of these individual oysters in this reef. Uh, they're very, very dense. Uh, they can be you know, thousands of oysters just in this one picture. Uh, so you can imagine the cumulative effect of all of those oysters on the water around them. So now we know a little bit about what the oysters do. What about the reefs themselves? Well, like I already mentioned, the reefs, um, because they're such a large physical three-dimensional structure, um, they're going to have direct impacts on waves and currents. Um, so they can uh, absorb wave energy, break up waves, and that's going to help uh, protect shorelines that are behind them. Uh, it's going to help keep the sediment that is near those reefs uh, in place. Uh, and that's also gonna have a feedback in keeping the, the sediment 
along that shoreline in those in near those reefs from being resuspended back into the water. And it's going to help keep that water clearer because it doesn't have those sediments in it. Uh, it also keeps the nutrients in those sediments from being resuspended in the water, and that's going to help you know reduce the nutrient loads in those waterways. And then because they are a three-dimensional structure, they're going to provide habitat for hundreds of species. Um, you know, they give a stable structure that species like crabs and shrimp um, and small fish can actually live inside uh, the, the oysters or in between the oysters on those reefs. Um, and it's going to provide them sort of safe places, homes, nurseries. Uh, it also provides hard structure for other sessile animals to settle on and grow, things like mussels, barnacles, sponges. Uh, and also food for fish, food for birds that come and forage on these reefs. Uh, and like I mentioned, they can actually be a sable substrate that mangroves can actually grow on uh, and form new mangrove islands. So here's an example here of a relatively small oyster cluster from the St. Lucie estuary. Um, and so this is just a few oysters uh, in this cluster here. And this is actually supporting a community of barnacles, uh, tunicates, and mussels, all in this relatively small oyster cluster. And these are obviously just the things that are sessile, uh, they're not moving around. You know, before we picked this cluster up, it had shrimp and crabs and lots of other things living in there as well. Um, so even small clusters of oysters can be a really important habitat uh, for other species. Okay. So let's move on and talk a little bit about some threats to oysters. So we know they're important, we know some of their life history. What's happening to oysters? Why are lots of oyster populations declining or have declined in the past? Uh, well, one of the big ones is over harvesting. Um, so uh, the commercial fishing of oysters um, resulted in basically overtake um, too many oysters were being taken out faster than oysters could replace themselves, and a lot of fisheries started to decline over time. Uh, as an example here in Chesapeake Bay, so what you're looking at on this axis is the weight of oysters being harvested, um, which is basically a proxy for number of oysters. And, and here you have uh, the date. So it starts in 1970, goes to about 2000. And so you can see that in the 1970s, there was a lot of oysters being harvested and it starts to decline over time. By the 1980s, um, there's quite a few less oysters being taken. Uh, and then by the 1990s, there was a huge crash um, and very few oysters compared to you know, earlier were actually being harvested. Uh, and then very little recovery up you know, into the 2000s. Uh, and this isn't because the oyster fisher, fishermen were trying to catch less. They weren't, it's not like they were catching less, you know, purposely. They were basically, there was less oysters there, so they were putting in more and more effort to catch less and less oysters. Uh, and that's indicative of basically a population decline in those oysters. Now, there's a num number of other factors that go into that decline. Um, and diseases are another one that's really important to oysters. There's a lot of diseases. I'm not going to talk about most of them. I'm just going to talk about a couple that are relevant locally. Um, so there's a parasitic disease called dermo, uh, which is a disease in oysters that can make the oyster much more susceptible to predators, uh, make it more susceptible to salinity, um, temperature fluctuations, Basically, it weakens the oyster by stealing resources, interfering with tissues, um, and can lead to oysters overall being less healthy and, and having some contributing to population decline. Uh, and there's a bacterial infection, Vibrio, uh, which is an infection uh, bacteria that actually produces toxic compounds. Uh, and those compounds um, are damaging to lots of animals, humans included. Um, so potentially at really high levels of infection, um, you know, you can get Vibrio toxins that are toxic to humans that eat it. Uh, and these are both related to some of the water quality factors. So Dermo tends to be more common at higher salinities. Uh, Vibrio 
a lot of factors go into it, but tends to be higher at higher temperatures. Um, now, speaking of temperatures, let's talk about climate change. So climate change is actually starting to be thought to be a major significant threat to oysters for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is altered temperature regimes, which may interfere with spawning of oysters. Remember that a lot of species rely on certain temperature thresholds to initiate spawning, and if those temperature regimes change, it may interfere with that. Uh, ocean acidification has resulted in more carbon dioxide getting into seawater uh, could also be a significant problem. Um, basically, as more carbon dioxide carbon dioxide gets in the water, uh, the water gets more acidic. That acidity is going to interfere with shell development. Uh, it's going to make it much more difficult for oysters to grow and maintain their shells. Uh, and that means that those oysters are going to typically be smaller, they're going to be more vulnerable to predators, uh, they're going to be more um, more of their energy is invested into that shell rather than growing bigger uh, or feeding and all the other activities they need to do. All right, now let's talk about some threats that are really relevant locally. Um, one of those threats is changes in habitat quality. Um, one of the really big threats we have here is freshwater inflow. Um, now you can get increased freshwater inflow in estuaries for a number of reasons, uh, watershed changes, so you know communities being built, having uh, you know, basically canals or drainage ditches that flow directly into the estuary rather than filtering through the water or filtering through the soil when it rains. Um, in our case, we have a direct connection to Lake Okeechobee that was put there basically to allow the lake to be drained for water level management. Um, that puts a lot of fresh water into our estuary. And if you get enough of that, fresh water can actually lower the salinity in the water below what oysters can tolerate. Um, or if you have a lot of fresh water coming in, like we do from Lake Okeechobee, you can actually physically push the larvae that are trying to settle out of that estuary and keep them from settling. Uh, and that can, you know, obviously slow down recovery. Um, in, in cases where oyster reefs have died off from having too much fresh water. Now, often with that fresh water, you get a lot of suspended solids. So you get, you know, sand and sediment coming off of um, upland areas. And um, that suspended solids are going to be potentially problematic for the filter feeding of those oysters. So you get a lot of non-edible particulates in that water they're going to be filtering more and more, a higher and higher proportion of things that they can't eat. And that means they're wasting energy dealing with that or digesting that instead of actually eating food items. Um, and potentially, if there's a lot of suspended solids, which we sometimes get uh, in the St. Lucie estuary, can actually be enough to physically bury the oysters. Um, and that's obviously going to be a real big problem for the oysters. Um, it's typically going to kill them by smothering them. Um, and it also means that that hard structure is no longer in the water column. And so when the larvae are there, they're not going to be able to settle on that structure anymore. It removes that hard substrate from the environment. Okay, and that is a really big problem that we have in the St. Louis estuary. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, so let's talk very briefly about what the oysters are that we have here locally. Uh, so we have our main uh, reef building species is Chrysostria virginica, the eastern oyster. Um, and it's found throughout the east coast of the US as well as the Gulf Coast. Um, and it's our main, again, it's our main species that builds oyster reefs. Now there is another species, the flat tree oyster uh, that occurs in South Florida, um, but it's, much lower abundance uh, typically grows on mangrove prop roots, hence the name tree oyster, um, and doesn't create the large uh, reefs that we, we see uh, from the eastern oyster. So I'm going to focus on the eastern oyster. So Chrysostria virginica has 
um, a number of physiological requirements. It has certain water conditions that it has to have in order to survive. Uh, so salinity is a really big one locally that's important. Um, they do best around 14 to 28 parts per thousand of salinity. Uh, so to give you a frame of reference for that, um, freshwater is obviously zero parts per thousand. Uh, ocean water is 32 to 35 parts per thousand. So they like to be somewhere in the middle between that, basically brackish water. Um, now, they can tolerate below that and above that. Um, so they can, they can tolerate all the way down to five parts per thousand, but it's going to slow the growth down um, and they're not going to grow as quickly. They're not often going to be as healthy. Um, if you get below five parts per thousand for more than a few days, that's going to start uh, causing mortality in most cases. Uh, again, they can also survive above 28 parts per thousand, up to about 40, uh, again, with reduced growth. Um, and again, if you go above that, you're going to start seeing mortality of those individuals. And something that's very important here locally is that when you're on the higher side, 25, 28, or above um, average salinity, the oysters are typically going to do best intertidally. So you normally think that an oyster, being a marine species, is going to be happiest and do the best when it's always underwater, subtitle. Um, and that is the case at lower to moderate salinity. Um, but as you get to the higher salinity, um, you get more problems with diseases, you get more problems with predators, particularly when the temperatures are high. Um, and that means that the oysters basically aren't going to do very well subtitally. They do okay intertidally because being exposed to the air for part of the day tends to kill a lot of the diseases, gives them a, a break from predators, um, and basically means that your salinity and your temperatures are sort of going to tell you whether your, your oysters are going to be limited to the intertidal zone or if they can occur in both intertidal or subtidal. And that's a really relevant um, component to our oyster restoration program. Uh, they obviously have uh, certain oxygen demands, you know, they're animals, so they need oxygen, pH, temperature, um, they have, have requirements for that as well. Um, but at least locally, in most cases, you know, we're, we're well within those ranges. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the sort of local historic extent of oysters and the decline we've seen and why we want to do oyster restoration. Okay, so what you're looking at here is you're looking at the St. Lucie estuary. Um, so you have the North Fork up here, South Fork here, Middle Estuary, and all the way down to Hell's Gate here. And you're looking at, in the orange, is the predicted extent of oyster reefs throughout the St. Lucie estuary in about 1940s and 1950s. So you can see they're pretty common. They occurred over a large portion of the sort of shallower areas of the estuary. And then if we move ahead and look in the 1960s, 70s, start to see that a lot of those oyster reefs were lost. Um, now we're down to just a few uh, areas of reef, uh, much, much smaller than what we had. And then you move ahead to 1996, we've lost even more. Um, and so it's estimated that in that time frame, there was a loss of over 80% of the coverage of oysters throughout the St. Lucie estuary. Uh, now, we were actually involved in a project recently with South Florida Water Management District to actually remap uh, where the oysters are now uh, to get an idea of what the extent of oyster reefs are um, today. Uh, and hopefully that map will actually be out pretty soon. It should be publicly available, um, hopefully in the next couple months. And so that'll sort of help uh, inform us uh, some more of how the estuary is actually doing. But let's talk about where some of that decline came from. Um, so what you're looking at here, even though it's kind of a weird graph to look at, is you're basically looking at the amount of fresh water being discharged out of Lake of Chobe over several different years. So each color is a different year. And you don't need to get a whole lot out of this. But what, the point I want to make is that in some years, there's massive quantities of water being released from Lake of Chobe going into the St. Lucie estuary. Um, sometimes three or four billion gallons per day 
Uh, and that can have a massive impact on lowering salinities, bringing a lot of suspended solids, and even pushing larvae out of the estuary that are trying to settle. So let's look at the impact of that. Um, so here uh, on, on this axis, you're looking at the number of live oysters per square meter, so the density of oysters. Um, and so that's showing up here in the bars. Um, let's look at this blue one here. So um, the other part of this graph is the flow rate of fresh water coming out of Lake Okeechobee, and that's these gray bars. And so you, let's look at 2013. So you can see prior to a big discharge event, there was quite a few oysters. So there was, you know, 500 oysters per meter square at this particular site uh, when there was very little discharge. And then you see this massive discharge event occur over a few months. And by the end of that, when they went back out and sampled again, there was virtually no oysters at this site. Uh, and you see that occur at the other sites as well. When that discharge event occurred, you had a massive decline in the oyster population, the St. Lucie estuary. That decline persisted in the next year. And eventually, when there was less discharge, there was a pretty significant recovery. Um, and you see that in other years as well. 2008, also you saw this massive decline in oyster population corresponding with a discharge event uh, that brought a lot of fresh water in the estuary. So now we know, you know, a little bit about what oysters are, some of the threats facing them. We know locally that a lot of the oyster loss is um, due to periodic events uh, that happen due to freshwater discharges, at least in the St. Lucie estuary. So where does our oyster restoration program come in? How do we do restoration? Well, uh, our program that's called FLOR, the Florida Oceanographic Oyster Restoration, um, and we target two main areas. We target the St. Lucie Estuary here and the Southern Indian River Lagoon. Uh, and we sort of target both those areas for restoration because they're complementary. Uh, in the St. Lucie Estuary, um, at least in the middle estuary in the lower north and upper south fork, the salinities there are really optimal for oysters. Um, that's why historically you had really good, really healthy populations of oysters. However, that is not the case during discharge events. And so we get these periodic diebacks of these oysters in these areas when you have freshwater discharges coming out of Lake Chobe. And so we know that when we restore oysters in the St. Lucie estuary, that most likely they're going to be heavily impacted at some point in the future by a freshwater discharge. Um, and so we restore them there knowing that because when we put our reefs out there, and I'll show you how this works in a second, we're providing a hard substrate. We're providing a hard structure that oyster larvae, spat, can colonize on and start to build a new living oyster reef. Uh, and even if all of those oysters are killed during a freshwater discharge, that structure remains at least for a few years, and it's gonna provide an area that can kickstart recovery following that discharge event where new larvae can come in and recolonize and start producing a new oyster reef. Now, um, to go along with that, we also restore oysters in the uh, Indian River Lagoon. Now, in the Southern Indian River Lagoon, the salinities tend to be a little on the high side for oysters. Uh, and they're in that range of salinity where the oysters are not gonna do very well subtitally. They're gonna be limited to the inner tidal zone. And so that really reduces sort of the aerial coverage that oysters can do well in, in the Southern Indian River Lagoon. But we still restore oysters there for a few reasons. One, we can use them for um, helping provide shoreline protection, but it also provides a source population for oyster reefs in the St. Lucie estuary. And that's because when you have all this fresh water impacting the um, St. Lucie estuary, it doesn't impact the Indian River Lagoon to the same extent. So even if you know, many of the oysters in the St. Lucie die off from that fresh water, many of the oysters in the Indian River Lagoon survive and do okay. Um, and that means that after this event, 
these adult oysters that are surviving out in the, the southern Indian River Lagoon can spawn, produce oyster larvae, which can be pulled into the St. Lucie estuary by currents and start recolonizing those um, dead oyster reefs fairly quickly um, after a discharge event. And so that's sort of the, the complementary part of our restoration. So I re restore in both places, uh, even though we know that there's sort of some issues on both sides. You know, they help each other out. Okay, so how does our restoration work? Uh, well, our restoration actually utilizes recycled oyster shells. So we get our oyster shells from local restaurants. Um, they're the shells that when you buy oysters, they shuck the shell. Normally they would go in a trash can, end up in the landfill. Um, instead, we give these restaurants buckets. Uh, they put the shells in those buckets. We go by a couple times a week, collect up those uh, buckets full of shell, give them fresh ones bring the shell back to our site, um, and then we put them out on these drying tables. Uh, and these drying tables allow us to dry that shell out um, for a couple months. Um, before we put any of these oyster shells in the water, we wanna make sure they've been dried out in the hot uh, sun for at least three months. And it's gonna make sure that any parasites that come along with those shells are definitely dead. Um, and we're not gonna be introducing any of those um, parasites our diseases to our waters by doing this. Um, so the next step is bagging those shells up. And so we have volunteers uh, come by uh, and they bag thousands of bags of oysters every year. Um, basically, they take the shells, they rake them into these um, plastic mesh bags. And those bags are about 10 pounds uh, and they essentially become Lego blocks that we can build oyster reefs with. And I'll show you how that works in a second. Uh, but the reason we use the mesh, um, the reason it's actually a pretty common um, method for doing oyster restoration is because if you just took oyster shell and you just put it out in the estuary, uh, with the amount of wave action that we have from boats and storms, that shell would just get tossed around, it'd get dispersed and eventually would end up settling and getting buried, uh, and it really wouldn't um, help very much. So that mesh is gonna help hold the oyster shells together uh, and make it a stable structure uh, that you know, is gonna persist through waves uh, and storms. Now, how do we actually build these reefs? Well, basically we use those bags like Lego blocks. Um, we have uh, volunteers uh, come out, they pick those bags up, they move them out to our site, and they stack them up. And the other nice part about these bags is they're really flexible in how you can build a reef. Uh, if you're in the St. Lucie estuary and you wanna build a really low subtitle reef that's really wide, you wanna get a lot of surface area on that reef, you can do that with these bags. If you're on the St. Lucie estuary and you know your oysters are only gonna do well uh, intertidally, you can build your reef narrower and taller by stacking more bags higher and get that reef the top of it up into the intertidal zone where you know the oysters are going to do well. And so it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you build these reefs. That's really important when we're trying to, you know, restore oysters in two fairly different estuaries. Uh, and again, I do want to point out, these are um, a lot of the work that's done and this is done by volunteer citizen scientists. Um, you know, the, the bulk of the effort is done um, physically by these, these volunteers. And it's important uh, for, for something I'll talk about in just a few slides. So what happens to those reefs? Well, obviously we're putting out dead oyster shells. So that shell isn't, you know, gonna, you know, recover and be a, an oyster itself. But what we're doing is we're providing a hard substrate that oyster larvae that are occurring in the water um, from nearby adults can settle on, attach, and grow and produce a new living oyster reef. Um, and we use oyster shell because oyster larvae, um, again, can be somewhat selective and the calcium in that shell, along with other things, uh, encourages them to settle on these reefs. Uh, it also has the right pH and everything else that the oysters are looking for. Uh, and so when we put these oyster bags out, they look like this. 
Uh, again, they're about 10 pounds. They're held together by this plastic um, black mesh. Um, and then over time, so this is about a year later, uh, you can see oysters have settled on this. They started to grow. Uh, they started to produce an actual oyster reef. And they started to encase that whole module uh, and encase the plastic bag itself. And then after a few years, um, you know, you can get, ideally, uh, you're going to get so much recruitment that you're getting multiple layers of oysters, uh, and it's going to cement that whole structure together. It fully encases the plastic mesh bag, uh, and it produces a fully functional oyster reef. Uh, it's going to give you all those benefits we talked about. Here's a couple examples. Um, so here's some reefs uh, in the uh, Inu River Lagoon. Uh, these are all intertidal reefs, so you can see we can build them up high to the individual bags uh, on these reefs here. And then on these reefs here, you can see over time, they started to sort of cement together. Now, as a little bit more of a close-up example, uh, here you can see this reef on the right is about a year old. And so you can see that there's some oysters settling on it, but you can still see the bags, you can still see the original oyster shells. And after about two years, you now have so much oyster settlement and so much growth that you don't even see the bass, you don't see much of the original oyster shell. And what you have is a pretty consolidated oyster reef um, that's gonna have a lot of the natural functions. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're targeting is sort of these, these reefs that we provide that stable hard substrate and the oysters, they're already in the water column. They're gonna settle on that. They're gonna utilize that start growing and they're going to create a new oyster reef from that hard substrate that we've provided. Okay, so that's the basic goal of our entire restoration program is providing that hard substrate to give oysters a place to settle on and start producing a reef. So given that there's a lot that goes into basically picking out what sites and where we actually want to do restoration and where restoration has a good chance of actually being successful. Um, now, the reason, you know, that that's important to think about is we can't, you know, we have limited resources. There's only so much oyster shell being produced by restaurants. We can't just put oyster shell out everywhere. Um, and so we have to be picky about where we try to do oyster restoration. Um, and so when we're thinking about picking sites, there's a few things that go into that sort of thought process. One of the first ones is making sure that site um, has the right physiological requirements. So if you go to a site and you don't see oysters, it might be that the oysters aren't there because the salinity is wrong or there's not enough oxygen, um, pH is wrong, something like that. And so we wanna make sure that that site has the right physiological requirements, okay? Um, now, again, in, in our estuaries, um, the salinity is a big factor. Um, DO is also a factor, um, dissolved oxygen. Uh, you know, you don't want to be, you know, maybe, maybe back in the back part of a marina or a canal system where the oxygen level tends to be very low and it's not enough to support oysters. Okay. Uh, you also need to make sure there's enough water flow because it's that water flow that's going to bring in food for the oysters. Uh, it's also going to bring in the spat, the larvae, um, and you also have to make sure that there's a stable enough sediment. You know, if it's a nice hard packed sand on the bottom, then those bags we put out are going to stay there. But if it's, say, really soft, thick muck, like you get in some places in St. Lucie Estuary, those bags are just going to sink right through that muck, uh, and they're going to end up just being buried, and that's obviously not going to be a successful reef. And so when we're thinking about sites, it's not just as simple as go find a site in the St. Lucie uh, or the Indian River Lagoon where there are no oysters. Uh, there's lots of those, uh, but we also need to make sure that that site has the right conditions to support an oyster reef once we've provided that hard substrate. Um, another factor that goes into it, since we're relying on taking advantage of that oyster life history of where they produce planktonic larvae, uh, that settle on hard substrates, we prefer to work in areas where there is oyster larvae coming in naturally and there's just nowhere for them to settle on. Uh, and so we look for oyster recruitment uh, and you can do that a number of different ways. You can look at um, dock pilings, uh, mangrove prop roots, um, rocks at a site, 
Uh, or if those things aren't around, um, you can put out these things called oyster stringers, um, which are basically temporary structures that have oyster shells on them. Uh, you can put them at your site and see if you're getting recruitment onto those. And that's a good indicator that if you put out your um, oyster bags full of oyster shell, you'll get recruitment onto those bags. Okay, so in sort of broad terms, what do we look for when we look for a good site for doing oyster restoration? Well, one, we want to look for a site that doesn't already have a lot of oysters. Um, otherwise, there's no reason to do restoration. Um, but within that, what do we look for? Okay, and I'll sort of go through an example site here to sort of tell you how we think about it. So this is a site where um, it's a little hard to see, but when you look through the water here, there's, no, there's not really many oysters here. Okay, um, this is sort of a sandy, soft, little soft, but sandy bottom. Um, but if you look over here in just the corner, you can see there's one, you know, about two foot wide rock. And on that rock, it is covered in healthy adult oysters, multiple layers of oysters. Um, and that tells us that this site, even though there aren't oysters throughout most of the site right now, it can support oysters or is likely to be able to support oysters. There's the water quality, the salinity is probably good enough. Uh, it supports these oysters. The, there's enough oxygen to support them. There's a larval supply coming in that's settled on these reefs, particularly because there's multiple layers of oysters. It means there's probably several years of oyster larvae coming in and settling on this. And that tells us that this site is likely to have uh, good oysters coming in and settling, they're likely to survive very well. Um, and the only thing the site is lacking is that hard substrate. There's just not any hard substrate here for oysters to settle on. And so this is kind of that ideal sort of site that we're looking for where we can provide that hard substrate and kickstart oyster restoration at this location. Now, I said we prefer to work at sites where there's natural oyster larvae coming in, but we don't have to. You know, you can actually work at sites where you're providing the hard substrate, but there isn't a natural oyster settlement. And this can happen in certain areas where maybe the currents just aren't quite right to bring oysters in from the few surviving reefs that there are. Um, you know, maybe you're somewhere really far away from surviving oysters. Uh, there's just not enough oysters coming in. Uh, and there's a couple of ways you can deal with that. One, you can get oyster larvae from an aquaculture uh, source. Um, and this is actually something we've done in the past. Uh, we've actually partnered with a um, oyster hatchery uh, that's on site. And we've worked with them uh, to basically get oysters to spawn uh, in tanks uh, from oyster stock. Those uh, oysters are then grown out uh, sometimes in oyster gardening, uh, which is another collaborative effort with volunteers. And then those oysters that were spawned from an aquaculture setting can then be deployed onto a reef that has the structure but doesn't have the larvae. Uh, and so we sort of complete that other missing component. And then those, those larvae that came from aquaculture uh, can then settle, grow, and become their own source for producing new larvae that can help settle that reef and nearby reefs. Another option, if you can't use aquaculture oysters, um, which can happen for a variety of reasons, um, is you can actually relocate um, oysters, young oysters, oyster spat, from one site that has a lot of good recruitment to a site that doesn't. Um, and there's different ways you can do this. Um, there's some commercially available modules like this one here, it's called Oyster Catcher. Um, basically it's designed to be hung off a dock uh, and you get oysters settling on there. Uh, and then once you get a bunch of spat, you can then take that module, move it to a reef, um, put it on a reef that doesn't have good colonization. And again, you start sort of kickstart that new population. Uh, and you can also use our bags you can basically take the bags, you can put them on top of a reef or maybe in riprap or something like that um, and get a lot of uh, settlement at a site that has good settlement. Then take those bags, move them and incorporate them into a reef that doesn't have good settlement. Again, making a new adult population. Okay, so now that we know how our 
restoration works, let's talk a little bit about one of the growing concerns um, that I'll probably get a question about, and we have a growing recognition uh, among the scientific community that it is potentially a problem, or it's not ideal, um, and it is the, mat the plastic mesh that we're using. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done looking at microplastics, um, and so we know um, actually from a project that we're involved in uh, that in the Inner River Lagoon, there are a number of microplastics occurring in our water. Um, so we found uh, microplastics in surface waters. We've also found microplastics inside of oysters. Um, so actually, oysters are filtering microplastics uh, when they're doing filter feeding, and sometimes they're actually digesting or attempting to digest those microplastics and even incorporating them into their tissues. Um, now, there's not a lot of evidence so far to suggest that those microplastics are coming from the bags um, that we're using. They're typically coming from other sources, um, but you know, it's, it's a sign that plastics are maybe not the best thing to be using in some cases. Uh, there's also some uh, work being done in the early uh, stages that show that the compounds being leached out of those plastic bags um, can actually slightly shift the sex ratio of young oysters that are settling on those reefs. Um, and so we, we recognize, and there's a growing understanding among um, restoration practitioners, that we would like to get away from those plastic mesh bags. Now, the reason that those bags have been used for so long and we still use them is they're one of the few options that actually work in our area with our particular situation. So remember that we're working in an estuary where the oysters are gonna do best subtidally and another estuary where the oysters are gonna do best intertidally. So we need to have flexibility in how we build our reefs. Um, we're also working in the situation where, you know, we know there's gonna be periodic dieback and you're gonna lose mostly live oysters. So we need to make sure we have a really stable structure that can survive until new colonization of oysters happens. Um, and because we're a volunteer-based or a citizen science-based program, we need modules that are usable and deployable by volunteers. That's why our bags are around the 10-pound range. You know, they're easy to pick up, they're easy to move around, you don't need specialized equipment, you know, you don't need a big boat with a big lift on it to, to move your modules out. Uh, and they're reasonably cost-effective as well. And so there are plastic-free alternatives that are out there that people are using. We're, we're working on some of them. Um, there's the oyster catcher, which is basically, it's a commercially available option. Uh, it's essentially cement-soaked cotton rope. Um, it's pretty pricey for the size um, that you're looking at. Uh, and it's difficult to build that three-dimensional structure that we need. Uh, you can use rock. Um, you can use small rock, which is easy to move, but those small rocks tend to be a little bit unstable. They can get knocked around by waves. Um, and if, so if you're in our areas that tend to have fairly, you know, moderate high wave energy, your reef can be unstable um, and get dispersed because of that. And then you sort of have to use really large boulders, which can be very heavy. You need specialized equipment to move them. You can't do that with volunteers. Um, you can use core modules, which is actually something we've been testing out recently, which are basically um, oyster shells embedded in a cement matrix. These work really good in low energy environments uh, in the northern estuary. Um, and you know, they're a good option in those places where you have a nice shallow slope, you have a lot of intertidal zone. Um, but here, they been, haven't been quite as successful because we don't have quite that large of an intertidal zone. Our slopes a lot narrower, we have higher wave energy, uh, and there's some challenges with using those. We can't get that three-dimensional structure we need for intertidal reefs. Uh, there's reef balls, which are cement um, structures that have been used both in coral reefs uh, and for oysters. Um, these are pretty successful, but they're very expensive. They're very heavy. They can be 50 pounds to 100 pounds, um, so they're hard to move, hard to make. Um, there's also options like um, using cotton um, mesh bags uh, or um, burlap mesh, hemp mesh bags. Um, the problem with those is they don't tend to hold up to the wave environment we have. It's so hot, it's so much sun here, they tend to get degraded and rot pretty quickly and the waves just break them up. And so there's, uh, there's a lot of challenges to these plastic-free alternatives. 
But I do want to point out, we're in the early stages of a, a funded project um, that FOS is leading to try and develop and test um, some new plastic-free modules that are designed specifically for our area uh, and our program. So they're, they're designed to be modules that are volunteer friendly. So they're in that like 10 to 20 pound range. Um, you know, they don't require specialized equipment to, to, to move and deploy. Um, they give us the flexibility to build reefs in different sizes and shapes, you know, reefs that we can build up into the intertidal zone when we need to, um, and be cost effective, something that is affordable and reasonably priced um, for actually building. And ideally, we'll also utilize our method of using recycled oyster shell um, rather than just, say, a cement or something like that. Um, and so I think this is a really exciting step forward for our program. Um, you know, we're really hoping we can start utilizing plastic free options um, and start, you know, getting away from those mesh bags over time. Uh, and this is also my opportunity to put in a shameless plug. Um, if you're um, someone or know someone who has um, experience working with uh, cements, um, cement mixtures, or making, you know, wooden molds or frames, uh, that might be useful for making these different modules. We would absolutely be happy to have the help if you're interested in volunteering. Uh, it's certainly something we could we could really use. Um, so that's sort of my shameless plug for this for this particular project. Um, but again, I just want to point this out that um, you know I think this is a really really exciting step forward for our program. So that's it. So um, I'll go ahead and start looking at questions. So if you haven't sent your question in already. Um, you know, I know we're a little bit over time, but I'll answer as many of the questions as I can. Okay. So let's start looking at these questions. Um, so, uh, when you talked about different species in the area, are those all under the umbrella of eastern oyster? It seems that there is the one that comes up in the most articles I've read uh, came a bit late. Okay, um, yeah, so in our area, the main reef building species is Chrysostra virginica, which is the eastern oyster. Um, and so that is primarily what we were talking about today. And as Tom points out, uh, Eastern oysters do have a siphon, um, and so they, they can process food um, using that um, and not through their gills. And so that is actually a, a very important point that I didn't really wanna get into um, during the talk, just to save time. Um, but it does give them a flexibility in how they actually deal with their food and how they can process uh, potentially things like microplastics and non-food particles uh, with a little more selectivity. Um, it's a question about um, oysters as a carbon sink, and that's true. Uh, oysters um, can actually sequester carbon out of the water, um, and that's because their shells have a lot of cow, uh, have a lot of carbon in them. Their tissues have a lot of carbon, um, and um, by building those tissues and by building those shells, they're going to be taking water out of the um, uh, they're going to be taking water and they're going to be filtering some of that carbon out in that process uh, and they're sequestering it into those hard structures um, in their shells which can last for quite a long time even after the animal dies um, and so that's a really important carbon sink okay um, so pseudofeces uh, I don't really want to go too much detail about how pseudofeces actually work. Um, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about how pseudofeces work, so I don't actually have a super good answer um, for the exact details of how pseudofeces processing um, works. Um, Tom, uh, feel free to elaborate on that if you'd like. Um, but Chesapeake Bay, um, there's some different estimates about how quickly the oysters that are there now can actually filter the water in that estuary. Um, estimates range anywhere from um, several weeks to several months. Um, some estimates even more than that. Uh, and 
Some of that has to do with the fact that, um, you know, a lot of that is there's just so many less oysters there now, it's going to take them longer to filter the same amount of water. Uh, and there's also estimates that go into that that include the fact that some of the oysters that are there are less healthy because of more diseases. So they're filtering less water, or they tend to be smaller than they used to be. Um, so again, they're going to filter less water. Uh, elaborate on oyster loss related to nutrient pollution and bacterial pollution. Sure. Um, so there's sort of a feedback loop uh, when you have um, nutrient pollution and bacterial pollution. Uh, certain bacteria can be toxic to oysters uh, and that bacteria can actually be problematic for them uh, and potentially interfere with their feeding or kill them. Um, and so that can cause a die off of oysters. And then once you have less oysters, um, then obviously you're losing that um, process of having the nutrients taken out of the water by filter feeding. Uh, you're losing the process of filter feeding some of those bacteria out of the water. And so it's a little bit of a feedback loop um, of when you have less oysters, you're getting less filter feeding, and so potentially you have more nutrients and more bacteria in the water, and that can interfere with recovery of oysters. Uh, obviously, it can be detrimental to the water quality and other associated species. All right, uh, so Tom, you're asking, um, where is data to support that for every 10 pounds of oyster shell grown, 4.5 pounds of CO2 was sequestered from the atmosphere? Um, I actually don't know that number off the top of my head. Um, but I'd be happy to um, get some papers together for you and, and uh, discuss that at another time. Um, but I don't know what the exact number is, but yeah, oysters do do carbon sequestration uh, and a lot of it is going into the oyster shell. Uh, why are we still using plastic mesh bags? Uh, again, um, it's because it's unfortunately one of the only options that is currently functional for the types of reefs we need to build uh, with the volunteer base that we have. Uh, and like I said, we're really excited to start making, um, developing new options uh, that don't rely on those mesh bags. And that's a really important thing that we're working on now to try and uh, develop. Um, so Troy Ledford asked how many oyster reefs would be normal and how far away from that goal uh, are we? Um, well, that's a tough question. Um, it depends on whether you're talking about the St. Lucie Estuary um, or the uh, Indian River Lagoon. In the St. Lucie Estuary, um, you know, based on that, that uh, graph we showed earlier, you know, you'd expect the majority of the middle estuary and north and south forks um, to have oyster reefs throughout the entire um, shallow water area. So that's gonna be hundreds of acres of oysters. Um, we're looking at maybe 40, 30 to 40 acres now um, currently. And so we're at a small fraction. <coughs> and with a few exceptions, um, a lot of that acres of oysters is actually a restored oyster reef or partially restored oyster reef. Um, and so we have a long way to go. Um, is basically the, the, the short answer. Okay. Um, all right, so let me look. I think there might be a few other questions uh, in the chat section, and I'll try and answer some of those. Uh, what are oyster predators? Um, well, there's a number of different predators on oyster. Um, there's um, some, um, basically whelks, um, they're snails, uh, that are a big predator on oysters, particularly in the middle and upper estuary, but they occur here some. Um, they basically can um, burrow into the shell and eat the oyster. Um, there are birds uh, that will eat oysters. Um, there's uh, crabs that can get into the shells uh, and kill and eat oysters. Uh, so there's there's a wide variety of predators on oysters and again the predators are going to obviously depend on where you are um, a little bit exact species uh, and then there's a question of do we have any prototypes uh, for your plastic free models modules um, that's actually the process that we're in right now 
uh, we're sort of collecting together um, different uh, module ideas from another number of different programs. And we're in the process um, starting actually next month of building those prototypes and starting to see if they're feasible. Uh, and then we're gonna uh, make those modules and then we're gonna test them out uh, over the next year. Uh, and so we're, we're in the early stages, but I think it's still really exciting. Okay, um, so that is all the questions that I see. Um, so if there's any others, um, go ahead and type them in real quick and I'll try and answer. All right, well, if that's all the questions, then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. Thank you everybody for joining. Uh, I hope you uh, learned a lot about oysters and how our uh, restoration program actually works. And um, if you're interested, uh, you know, you can come out and help us uh, in our restorations. There's a number of different um, opportunities for volunteers. Obviously with COVID-19, some of those opportunities are gonna be a little different than they have been in the past, but we're happy to have any help we can, we can get from people. Um, particularly, you know, everybody brings their own expertise uh, and that's something that we can definitely use. All right, thank you.